thanks for that introduction and yeah i'd like to say uh, welcome to everybody as well it's fantastic that we're getting so many people coming to to this this great event and from from all over the world which is really brilliant really brilliant my my job is simply to chair um so i'm going to say not a lot really because you've not come along to to listen to me talking but um just to make sure that we we kind of get through what we want to do and also finish on time which will be one o'clock uk time um this is a this is a a fantastic event i mean first and foremost this is about launching mick's new book i'm sure you're all familiar with with mick cooper who's been um an influencer, writer, and all-round good person in the field for many, many years, and and a huge support to me personally as well. So it's a nice opportunity to to put on record a, a massive thanks to to Mick for the things that he's done to support me. Um, Mick, as you know, is a is a very well established author, um, but we're here to talk about his new book, Psychology at the Heart of Social Change: Developing a Progressive Vision for Society. And I know this has been a, a passion for Mick for many years, so it's absolutely fantastic to see. I think probably, and what he's what he's talked about as well, a life's work coming together in in many respects. Um, uh, uh, around this new publication, which I'm sure some of you will have or have on order. I have on order, but I have had sneaky previews of it. So it's it's I haven't had the hard copy yet, but it's it's looking great. And I know it's been received already hugely positively. I'm going to introduce the panel um, in just a, a, a few moments, but our aim is to, to, to launch Mick's book and to use Mick's book, I think, as a, as a context for discussions that we want to have around politics, psychology, counselling and psychotherapy. Um, and it also speaks to other work that's that's kind of just launching. Uh, Mick and others have recently launched a new group called Therapy and Social Change, and and in a sense, this this panel discussion today is a is a great opportunity to launch that. Um, and if you are interested in joining the the email discussion and probably getting access to some more free events down the line around politics and social change. Um, and therapy and social change, please, we will let you know the way in which you can do that. So I'm sure, John, we can probably circulate that information after the event. Um, we're also being co-hosted by CREST, which is the Centre for Research in Social and Psychological Transformation at the University of Roehampton, which, of course, is where um, Mick is professor. Um, and it's it's you know it's kind of bringing lots of ideas together. So our aim for today, I'm going to shut up in just a minute. I'm going to hand across to Catherine King, who is from Bristol University Press Policy Press, who are publishing Mick's book. Catherine's going to say a few words about the book, and then hand on to Mick, who's going to to talk to us a little bit. I think about the book, his thinking behind it, and what's brought him to this point in his career. And then we're going to move over to our superb panel. Um, we have Lucia Berdanini, who is joining us today, and Mara Khan, Jennifer Nadell, who I did see from the chat was struggling to get into the meeting. So hopefully she will now be in the meeting and Dwight Turner. And once Mick has spoken, I'll be inv um, inviting each of the panel to, to take a few moments to kind of respond to any points that, that Mick has said, but also any additional things they want to say around um, kind of issues around so social change and the politics of what we do, have a bit of a discussion, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to invite comments and questions from the audience, finishing at one. That's the plan today. So my job is just to make sure that that, that happens. So again, once again, thank you so much from me um, for coming along today. And I'm going to um, hand over now to Catherine. As I say, Catherine's from Bristol University Press, Policy Press, who are publishing Mick's new book. And I know Catherine's got a, a few words to say to us. Catherine, welcome. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak briefly. I, it will be brief so we can get on to uh, hearing from Mick. But I'd just also like to welcome you to the launch of Mick's new book. Um, it's an important book and it shows us why we need and can create a progressive politics that's profound, profoundly informed by insights from the psychotherapeutic and psychological domain moving us from a politics of blame to a politics of understanding. As Andrew said, I'm Catherine King. I'm the marketing manager of Policy Press, which is part of Bristol University Press. And we're the publisher of Mick's book, which we're obviously delighted to publish. Policy Press publishes work that seeks to understand social problems, promote social change and inform policy and practice, focusing on equality, diversity and social justice. Our core aim is to improve the day-to-day -day lives of people who need it most. 
Details of how to order mixed book will be available in the chat. Use the code PHS. C30 on for 30% discount from our website. The link is all oh, I see it's already there in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, Mick, as you all probably know, is an internationally recognized author, trainer, and consultant in the field of humanistic, existential, and pluralistic therapies. He's a chartered psychologist and professor of counseling psychology at the University of Roehampton. And I'm now going to hand over to him to talk about the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine and Andrew and uh, Policy Press for uh, taking this book forward and having some faith in it. And thanks everybody for coming along um, and all the people that are going to be talking today. Um, you know, there's so many people who've been involved in the development of the book and supporting me and inputting and I uh, particularly wanted to thank my partner, Julie, and the uh, colleagues at uh, Roehampton at Crest. Um, I guess around 15 years or so ago, I think it was, I wrote a book called uh, Essential Research Findings in Counseling and Psychotherapy. And I had the idea that um, I, I dedicated it to my oldest daughter, Maya, and I thought at the time, well, I'll do one book for each of my kids. Um, so I ended up having four kids, and uh, this is for the last of them, Zach. So I'm pleased to say uh, no more children and uh, no more books, I think. I think I pretty much said everything I wanted to say. Uh, as Andrew was saying in this book, it's really something very much from the heart about really trying to put everything out there that I really passionately believe in. I think people who know me have known that I've been, I guess, progressive throughout my life, really passionate about social justice. For me, the question of how we create a better, fairer world uh, has just always seemed to be the most important one to ask. Uh, it's given me personally a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, uh, very much in my life about how we can reduce suffering, uh, increase well-being, create a kind of world in which um, everyone has the capacity to thrive. And I think that that politics, um, you know, progressive politics, feminism, socialism, environmentalism, multiculturalism, uh, fighting for the rights of people with disabilities, trans people, I, I still feel it's an amazing thing. It's uh, it, it's it's people moving beyond their own self-interest and not just thinking about themselves or those close to them, but fighting for others. Uh, in many ways, I think, as I was writing this book, I was thinking, you know, it, it, it's something there about an expression of our highest human capacity, capability to reach beyond ourselves, to care for others and, and our world. I guess in the therapy world, we talk about as kind of mentalizing that ability to go beyond our own wants and needs. Uh, and, and recognize that others have wants and needs and feelings to be able to think into that and care um, and to care about that. My dad, he, my dad was an old school communist and he always used to say to me, I remember when I was growing up, he used to say, do unto others as you want others to do unto you. And uh, I guess I kind of at some level really internalized that. Uh, that kind of sense of mentalizing about thinking of others. Although I have to say, <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I was having an argument with my dad about whether he ever smacked me when I was younger. And he said, he said, you know, I never hit you, but if I did, I'm sure you deserved it. So <laughs> I think his capacity for mentalizing did have his limits as well. And I guess I think for me, this book about, um, I mean, I love, as I was saying, I love progressive politics, but I do think it has some blind spots having been involved in it for so many years. I think progressive politics sometimes is seen as talking down to people, as patronising, as belittling. Um, I think sometimes progressive talk can be very critical and negative about uh, what's going on in the world. And we so desperately need, I think, positive visions, uh, ideas about where it is that we're going and what we actually want to see, those kind of positive voices. And I think most importantly for me, that I think when progressive social justice uh, voices getting into kind of demonizing, rubbishing others, and that can be people from outside of the progressive field, but also sometimes inside. I mean, watching some of the arguments on Twitter, for instance, between pro trans people and gender critical feminists. And there's something really sad about seeing people who believe passionately in social justice and care for others really ripping each other to shreds. Um, and I do feel really strongly, I guess partly as a therapist, coming from a humanistic background, that um, when we get into demonizing, belittling others, progressive or not, I think we do something that is really contradictory 
uh, an undermining of a progressive ethic. It's, you know, the other becomes something less than us, something less smart, less good, less right. You know, if you think about that, do unto others, that's not doing unto others as we want others to do unto us when we're talking about people in that way. And I think we've seen in the 20th century and a number of the socialist humanists who I talk about in my book write about this is about what happens to a socialism when it goes down that route of black and white thinking, uh, negativity, uh, we're right and you're wrong and just the horrors that can end up and the dangers of progressivism when it goes down that route. I kind of feel as I was writing the book, I think every time you start talking or thinking or communicating with other people, right or, or or on the left is, is is kind of bad and wrong and stupid but however tempting that is and of course that is very tempting but i think whenever we do that we do end up colluding with a much more right-wing agenda that the world's about people against people there's good people and there's bad people there's right people there's wrong people and that to survive we need to kind of battle and dominate and prove our rightness it's a kind of politics that i think um it ultimately is never going to support a progressive social justice cause if, if we're engaging with people in, in ways that don't feel socially just, interpersonally just. As Andrew was saying that in my professional practice and writing today, nearly all my work's been in the therapy field about existentialism, relational depth, pluralism. Um, and in the therapy field, like many others, like the people in the States who've been working around multiculturalism and social justice competencies, for instance, I, th I think there's a massively important role that social justice thinking can play in developing uh, what we do in therapy. Uh, the focus on the relationship, the real awareness of difference and diversity and how much that means uh, for therapy. Uh, but I also think that, and this is what my book's about really, is that as therapists, myself as therapists, and not, not just, I guess, therapists, but therapy values, therapy thinking, therapy ideas, like the world's work of Carl Rogers, has also got so much to contribute to progressive social justice perspectives um, to really address some of those problems, that splitting, that demonization that I was talking about, to really help deepen and make progressive politics and that care for social justice, everything that it can be. I think it gives us that opportunity. And I just wanted to talk briefly about just three areas, which I think, you know, this is not about putting everybody on the couch and analyzing them to death, but I think that there's three areas that I particularly wanted to emphasize that I think we can uh, contribute. And the first one is, is going back to what I was talking about before, is about introducing that spirit, that, um, that, that, that uh, values of compassionate acceptance. That as therapists, what we do is we really deeply work, and we, of course we don't always get that right, but we really deeply work to accept others, to empathise with others, to be alongside others um, in a way that can deeply and profoundly connect with their experiences. We practice that day in, day out, um, that attunement with others. And I think maybe more importantly, what we learn is that it's possible to have that deep acceptance whilst also being able to fundamentally challenge someone. It doesn't mean we're saying what somebody does is right, is everything is okay. It doesn't mean if somebody's hurt others, we sit and say, yeah, that's great, well done. But what it means is that we're able to hold and value that person and, and to engage with that other as an other, um, whilst also holding that kind of ability to challenge their behavior. And I think that um, spirit, that capacity, has such an important potential place in progressive politics. There's a work that Jennifer and Compassion in Politics, for instance, are doing about developing an emotionally literate politics, a politics of the left and maybe more broadly, that isn't anymore about blaming and criticizing and demonizing and seeing the wrong in other people, but is genuinely about compassion, is about understanding, and is about creating a world by example, by showing what it means to relate to others as real human beings. Um, and I think there's also some amazing practices that are bringing that uh, attitude of uh, uh, compassion and understanding into our societies more generally, not just in therapy, um, things like social and emotional learning in schools, which I think is a massively important area that could be expanded, developed about helping kids learn to communicate and to dialogue and to talk to each other is an empathy training for kids. Fantastic. But kids come out of school, not just learning home economics or religious education or, or physics, 
But wouldn't it be amazing to have a world where kids came out of schools knowing how to have healthy relationships, knowing how to care about other people, uh, knowing about how to listen and having developed, you know, these are all skills that we learn. The evidence shows that we can learn these skills and the things that we've learned in therapy and, and, our, and our values and our uh, ways of understanding can, can be diffused out in a way that can really contribute, I think, to a more positive society. I would love to see uh, the, the progressive parties like Labour and Green have on their agenda these kind of issues about developing social emotional learning, positive parenting, uh, well-being economics, as well as another area that's really been developing. And I think the second thing is really deeply understanding people's needs and wants as therapists. We sit with people and we really get a sense of some of the things that people most fundamentally want in their lives, like relatedness, like self-worth, like a sense of meaning. And progressives have been fantastic in fighting and campaigning for equality around areas like housing and finance and safety and rights. And all these things are massively important. But also as therapists, we've learned that there's other things in life that are really important, like relationships, relational depth, like feeling loved and cared for. And then that raises a question of how do we create a world in which actually everybody can feel loved? and where everybody can feel that they're a person of worth. And I think these are issues that can really contribute to progressive agendas, not instead of the economics and those critical safety foundations, but also understanding the person more wholly in terms of everything we are and everything we need as human beings. And just the third thing is about one of the things that I've learned as a therapist is that when you're supporting change, what you're doing with a person is really helping the different sides of them learn to cooperate, learn to be compassionate with each other, learn to understand each other. You know, as a therapist, you're never saying, well, let's get this part to compete with this part or this part to dominate or let's stir up competition between the parts because that's how you get the best, the best healing. And I think therapy, the principles of therapy have such a wonderful parallel with really how in the progressive field we think about change. Because from a progressive standpoint, we also think that the best change comes about through cooperation, through compassion, through understanding, not about through competition, not about through dominance. It's about giving, listening to marginalized voices, hearing those voices that have been silenced and giving them space. We do that in therapy. And that provides a really strong support, I think, for what progressives often hold, because it's saying that those progressive principles around cooperation, compassion, aren't just about socioeconomics. They're not just about how groups work, but they're more general, perhaps, systemic principles about how positive change can come about and how we can create something better. And particularly in my book, I write about the idea of synergies and that we create good things when we create synergies. When, when things can come together and cooperate. So I'm really looking forward to hear what my panelists will think and talk about this issue about how therapy can contribute to social change. And that's just some of the ideas that I've written about in my book. But I do think that, you know, as therapists, we don't have a, uh, 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 we don't know everything. Of course, we don't know everything. But I think we do have something unique and something special to contribute in the way that anthropologists do, in the way that eat economists do and I think a progressive force fighting for social justice that brings in therapeutic voices therapeutic understandings can really help develop the power and the ability to fight for a genuine progressiveness a genuine social justice that can help uh, more thriving for more people more of the time so thank you Mick thank you so much and and wow what a great Great opening and so much to to kind of think about there. Um, to, just just two two quick responses. One one which I have to deal with, of course, it's the the shocker of your opening that there will be no more books. And um, a I don't believe it. And b um, I think as a huge huge fan of ABBA, they they said they would never reform for forty odd years, and look where we are now. So you either have to write a new book or we'll be flocking to see you your hologram at a at a place in London in forty years time. Um, th more importantly, uh, is I mean, there's so much that I'm only just going to very quickly pick on one thing, which was your point around how hard it seems for us to be able to talk about these hugely important issues. And I sometimes wonder whether there is some 
some unconscious process that that facilitates us not talking about this maybe there, there's been some mechanism which has got in the way of us talking about this because of course the less we talk about in a in a relational and connected way the less things are likely to change for the better and shift forward so i i i think that's a really really interesting point I'm, I'm i'm much more interested now rather than listening to me uh talk is listening to to the views of the the panelists um and what i'm going to do is is invite each panelist one one at a time to to come forward and take maybe five minutes to to anything they want to respond to the that you've said and anything that they they wanted to to throw into to the debate as well and i want to begin with lucia Bodondini, who um lucia if you can um just say maybe a few words about you people have seen your your biography online but you know please do do feel free to introduce yourself lucia thank you thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here um i'm an associate professor at the university of east london i teach on a bsc counseling and i'm also course leader of a distance learning msc in humanitarian intervention and i'm a gestalt therapist as well so i also work privately with clients from a gestalt mainly perspective and i'm very pleased to be invited here these are very are, are themes very close to to my heart and i was just um, thinking in preparation <clears throat> for today, what is that I would like to share uh, with you? There are so many possible avenues. Um, I guess something that um, also in response to what Mick said, that I um, I would like to maybe contribute to, I completely you know, support this idea of enhancing and fostering a more compassionate, empathic relationship with each other and how therapeutic practice can somehow foster and model that and specifically something that in my opinion is very related to this as well is part of therapeutic practice um, that, that we do as practitioners is all the aspect of reflective practice and reflexivity and um, uh, you know question challenge explore within ourselves our possible prejudice and bias and um, feelings around various phenomena and how we can work around that to stretch them to um, work also out, our, uh, out of our comfort zone and how this is really important to keep expanding and to keep be able to encounter another person from an authentic place and at the same time from a really open uh, place. And I, I think that from this point of view, something that has always interested me, um, many, many years ago, I started studying uh, psychology as postgraduates. Um, in schools, uh, my area was um, tackling the phenomenon of bullying in school, and my specific interest was to develop uh, practical intervention in schools with children and teachers and parents. And um, we were actually very much fostering group work and and training children in uh, um, really reflect and exploring how they relate to each other but particularly what always has fascinated me is the role of bystander in group dynamics and later on you know in in bullying the role of bystander has a enormous responsibility in rooting the phenomenon now I work in a completely different setting in humanitarian, but again, looking at the humanitarian crisis, refugee crisis, war, conflict, again, in a wider <clears throat> uh, phenomena, the, the, the role of bystanders, you know, having an attitude towards humanitarian crisis that is either, this is too big, I could never possibly change anything. So let's just, you know, uh, be somehow outside of that or, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not a uh, racist. I'm not uh, a bully. I, you know, I do, I'm actually don't do anything wrong. So never question ourselves, I think is a major part of a lot of uh, problems. And, and I think that as a therapist, um, as we do with ourselves in terms of also I'm very passionate about decolonizing intervention, psychosocial intervention, curricula. It's all a process of revisiting where I stand and what I, how do I contribute to um, miss 
a crucial point to um, not respect another person is I don't think it's possible to talk about empathic and compassionate relationship if we don't include also all these other part that is more a reflexive uh, process where I need to reflect on what is my diversity, what is my uh, role of, um, you know, not, not respecting, not being inclusive. Um, and um, and I think that this can be fostered and, and I imagine I would like to offer much more opportunities for this because changing from a bystander to an activist is not something that happened like this. It's not just a question of have an insight and say, oh my God, actually, yes, I am a racist. From now on, I won't be anymore or I would. It's a process that goes through many stages that can be very difficult, that raises a lot of emotions like guilt and shame and denial. And we need to offer space to go through all that and, 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 and somehow supporting each other in that. So I, I you know, I, I, you also, yeah, I will, I will finish soon, but I will, uh, now <laughs> we, we open a short course on intercultural counseling and we really focus a lot on giving every week across 12 weeks, a lot of space for us and for students to reflect on the skill practice, not in terms of uh, the skills, but the internal process of each one of us, what did I miss? What did I, you know, what was the elephant in the room that I didn't name because I was too embarrassed? I didn't know the reaction and, and engaging debate around that. And I think that this is very important, give time and space for, uh, for all of us to, in, you know, to embark in this kind of process. I think I spoke too much, sorry. You didn't speak uh, too much this year. That was really interesting. Thank you. And and something about the the that, that last point you were making, something about the importance of that kind of um, kind of reflexive position in facilitating the the intrapersonal change and 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 thus the interpersonal change. I think it's a, a really important point. Thank you, Lucia. I'd like to invite Myra. Uh, Myra Khan. Um, again, Myra, five minutes. If you just want mm -hmm. to say a few words about yourself, and and over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel today. Really excited to be here with everyone. Um, quick introduction, putting me into a context. Um, I'm a counsellor, supervisor, counselling tutor, um, soon to be published author as well. Um, and I'm also the founder of the MCAPN, the Muslim Counsellor and Psychotherapist Network. Um, what I'm really struck by, as I've been hearing from Mick and from Lucia, is um, two words. And they're the kind of the two words or concepts that I'm going to very quickly kind of talk us through today. Um, the first one is the, the concept of context. And whenever I think about therapy and its relationship and its role um, with the wider social world and um, structural and, and social frameworks, very often, I think, especially when we're in training, we enter the world of therapy and then we somehow kind of stay in it and not really get a sense of how much it is actually within the context of social, external, structural and systemic frameworks. And so the word context is, is kind of a big concept that I've been teaching a lot on in recent years because there's this kind of myth that therapy exists in a vacuum. And of course it doesn't, it doesn't exist in a vacuum and it's not separate from the external world. It sits kind of right in the center of it. Um, because of course, um, to be able to acknowledge that therapy exists in the context of systemic and structural frameworks of power, oppression and inequality, we can straight away then recognize that the therapy profession itself, but also then our training, what we are then or how we are then taught to be with clients in the room, um, how we experience supervision, how we experience the training itself, all of it takes place within this external context. So I think there's something about, um, in a way, almost kind of re-evaluating and repositioning therapy back into the external context. They're not two separate things. So my first point is absolutely around understanding contexts, because the moment we understand the context of therapy and all the work that we do within it, training, therapy, supervision, all of it, we can then recognize and really understand and accept what is it we can then do in the therapy room 
with our clients. And that brings me on to the second concept, the word or the concept of truth. And I'm using that word with a capital T. And I think this links back to Mick, you were talking about compassion and understanding. And for me, this really, oh, this is so close to my heart. Because if we can sit with and accept the external context of social and systemic inequalities, can we then fully, authentically, honestly, and at times also can be challenging to really sit with and hear and listen and explore our client's truth? And what I mean by our client's truth is their lived experiences in that external systemic um, structural framework, but also then how their identity is shaped by their experience in that external world and how their identity then is impacted by that external world. So this idea that therapy is in a vacuum, um, our work takes, you know, is separate from the outside world. And therefore somehow when we're in the room with our clients, somehow the work we're doing then is separate from that. How can we possibly then really honestly, um, courageously sit with their experiences and Mick, you've already um, referenced you know, the racism and the sexism. And so how can we sit with our client's truth if we cannot accept and sit with the context of the work, you know, the context of the work that we're doing? Because once we can recognize that therapy exists in this external context, and when we can really sit with um, compassion and understanding, we ultimately can sit with accepting our client's truth, even when not if, when it is different to our own. Because of course, us being in that room as well, we sit with our identity and we sit with our truth. And so I think there's something really important here that I think is fundamental to the work, which is whenever we are in a therapeutic relationship or a supervision relationship, or even in a training relationship with our tutors, for example, and with students, in that, in that relationship, if there are two people, there are two truths, and two identities. And I think it's our ability really in training, it's our ability to learn and throughout our career, not just in training, of course, it's our ability to be able to sit with and hold that client's truth without it then being an attack on our own or us being defensive of our own. And so to really be able to embrace that, because once we can really sit with and work with a, with a client's truth, we have to then be able to not allow it then to do something to our own, to dismiss ours, or for us to even consciously or unconsciously deny our own. So if I'm sitting with somebody in front of me who's talking about their experience of racism or sexism, or any kind of ism or oppression that they've experienced, it has to be within my ability to say, I may not have experienced that exactly, I can empathize with their experience. And what I'm not going to do is dismiss, minimize, marginalize their experience just because I've not experienced it. So I think it's really powerful and important that we acknowledge and we start to sit with this external context in our work. And so, there we, so therefore then we can accept these two truths in the room. Because of course, by being able to do that, what we can also do fundamentally in bringing together this first concept of context and the second concept of two truths in putting these two together, ultimately, what we are doing is we are working towards and we are being invited to um, um, deliver and offer counselling, therapy, supervision, which is based on the foundation of anti-oppressive practice. I mean, that's really what I'm talking about and, and Mick, what you're alluding to in, in when you talk about the ability to recognise this is about social change. Um, because in order for us to sit with and really listen, hold, honour, value, respect a client's truth or a supervisee's truth, um, we have to recognise how it then also can get played out in the work that we do. And because, of course, as we know, as therapists and supervisors, we hold a huge amount of power in our relationships. So if, unless we can accept that we don't work in a vacuum, unless we can accept that we work with true truths, can we actually, at the very heart of it then, offer these relationships that, that in themselves are, um, are reparative, that are in themselves offering an experience of something that they don't experience out there in, in the external world, that we can offer a space that feels safe, offer a space in which there is equality being offered in these spaces. So that, um, and of course, knowing then how we might unintentionally recreate or reproduce oppressive dynamics in the room. 
So for me, this Myra, is absolutely. I'm, I'm yeah. going to have to jump in, Myra. I'm really, I know. really sorry because okay. you know I could listen to you for hours. That's, that <laughs> that's really okay. fascinating. I'm just, I'm just aware of the time ticking on. I hope, I hope you don't yeah. mind me interrupting you. No, that's um, absolutely um, fine. And it's I'm an sure that <laughs> the comments have been coming in. I'm sure we're going to come back to you on that, Myra. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Nadal, welcome. I hope you managed to get into the, the link in the end. I'd like to invite you to come uh, five minutes maximum again and just respond to, to kind of what you've been hearing so far and anything else that you'd like to, to contribute. Thanks so much and congratulations, Nick, on your fantastic book. Um, my name is Jennifer Nadal and I'm the co-director of Compassion in Politics and also the chair of a new global organization called the Global Compassion Coalition and both of them really work to put compassion at the heart of how we function as a society, how we make decisions. Um, and I'll just talk about the UK context and compassion in politics. I I've been in and around politics for the last 30 years and a decade ago I decided to stand for Parliament a couple of times um, and sat on the National Executive of the Green Party. And I had first-hand experience of the levels of toxicity that exist, even amongst those of us who are trying very hard to achieve a fairer and more just future. And I took a step back and, and wrote a book called We Are Manifesto for Women, which was really looking at what is the internal psychological work we need to do to prepare ourselves to be of use in the political space so that we don't simply reenact our own scripts, our own childhood trauma and wounding in the political space. And one doesn't have to look very far to see, you know, what 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 how much of that damage is played out with repercussions and harm caused across the world. Um, and then looking across the political landscape at all the social justice issues which you know, break all of our hearts, it felt that they were all connected, all connected by the absence of compassion. So if we can put more compassion in society, then we can raise raise the water level so that all of these other issues that we care deeply about can be addressed. Um, so we work to promote compassion as a value and as a practice. And we work on a cross-party basis um, out of out of necessity because I think that part of the problem in our political system at the moment is that it is predicated on conflict it's a binary tug of war over two different ideologies and 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 the very purpose of politics is lost in the process you know for me politics is about how do we right, create a fairer society how do we alleviate suffering and that really has no space in our current political procedures and systems you know you have to win a vote it you have to win an election you have to win your seat and the result is you know especially with the inflamed debate that we see in uh, you know the house of commons which wouldn't be acceptable in any other workplace the result is that we have a political space that is incredibly triggered. So we look in part at how can we create a safer space, a space where politicians aren't constantly in fight or flight, so that more nuanced thinking can take place, so that collaboration can take place. Um, I loved what, Mick, you said about the best change comes through compassion and also um, what well, everyone said, such brilliant things. Lucia, you know, the role of the bystander, we know that the bystander effect is one of the biggest inhibitors of compassion. So how can we enable everyone to have a sense of agency and a sense of hope and a sense that their voices will be heard and their vote, votes won't be wasted? And um, Mira, I also love what you said about two opposing truths, because at the moment we just have people clubbing each other with their version of the truth. And, and within that, you know, rightness becomes a problem because rightness builds internal walls in much the same way as, you know, right-wing politicians in the States try to bring, build a physical wall of bricks. You know, how, how can we connect with the other with whom we disagree 
um, so profoundly in a way that constructs a bridge so that we can actually achieve the social outcomes that we want. So we look at process and I'll just run through some of the things that we're doing and you're probably gonna have to stop me talking. Um, so, you know, what would a compassionate society look like? We'd have an economy that was our servant rather than our master. We, we um, do a bit of training in the House of Commons and we would see training basic, you know, when am I triggered? What happens when I'm triggered? Am I attacking because I'm triggered? All of those basic psychosocial awarenesses that most politicians don't have. Um, honesty, you know, how can we feel safe in an environment where people are telling lies with impunity? So we've introduced two bills recently into the House of Commons in an attempt to address that, or at least to create the space where it can be um, where it can be addressed. Um, and also just listening. You know, politics is not a place where reflective listening can take place. You know, we know from from practices like Imago, you know, the importance of rowing over to the other person's island and really trying to understand how they see things. But we've constructed a political system where that's not possible. So we have this situation where what we practice in our personal lives is completely absent. Those values are largely absent from the political space. And I just wanted to finish on a quote from Rumi, um, which is out beyond talk of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place and I will meet you there. I mean, how extraordinary would it be if we could have our political conversations in spaces that were safe, where we left our ideologies outside the tent and just came in with the intent of, of, of solving the crises that we face and systemic injustices and failures of our system. So um, we have a lot to learn from the field of psychotherapy and I'm so grateful that um, this conversation is happening and I hope we can take it forward. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that. And first, apologies, I pronounced your name incorrectly. So please forgive me for that when I introduced you. Um, but secondly, a really interesting point about how the, the, the polarised and very combative discourse in, in, in politics currently that we see and, and how that's, of course, paralleled in social media and in other walks of life and how perhaps one is also fueling the other. There's a cyclical process maybe with that. Uh, just before I go to, to Dwight as our final speaker, if you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like to put to the panel or share with the panel, please put them in the chat now, because when we've heard from Dwight, I'm, I'm going to go straight to the panel for um, responding to any thoughts or questions from people attending before we, we finish at one o'clock. So do, do type away in the chat, and I think John's going to keep an eye on that. I'd like to bring in Dwight, Dwight Turner. Um, many of you will know, know Dwight. Um, Dwight, if you'd like to come and say a few words about yourself and again, just five minutes to, to respond to anything you've heard or anything that you want to say. Hi, good. Uh, well, good afternoon to you all. I'm, I'm Dr. Dwight Turner from the University of Brighton. I'm a course leader on, in humanistic psychotherapy down here. I'm going to use just four minutes. I'm aware of the time. I know some of you have got some questions you want to ask. So I'm going to keep this nice and tight. Um, thanks to my colleagues for actually doing their, their bits already, and to congratulations to Mick on his book. I've read the book, by the way. I've got it a couple of days back. So, you know, I had a bit of time on Sunday night and read the book and stuff. And I found it really quite enjoyable. There are a few things that actually stood out for me from your, your talk, your presentations, from my, what my colleagues have said as well. I was going to show some slides. I'm not going to do that now because I can't be bothered for a start. But also, the second part is I actually want to talk from the heart a little bit. Because some of the things that people have said already actually made, made me make some notes of my own. And the first thing that came up for me around the book, and also what, what's been said already, is actually we're so tied together, we're so interrelational, we forget that actually some of these identities are socially constructed, that we are all actually caught, caught up in some sort of bi binary sort of uh, relationship. So white identifies black, men, uh, women, men, men identify women, and so on. Therefore, when we talk about how we're going to change any of these sort of constructs, you cannot change one without changing the other. The problem with some of that is this. In um, popular discourse, uh, a, lot, a lot of the time, whoever's been marked out as the other has been silenced. And one of the wonderful things about a book like this and a presentation like this as well is it gives the other back its voice. 
in some way. And that's the first step in, in towards any sort of um, realignment to actually have that sort of conversation between subject and object or self and other. The second part I want to raise is actually the fact that actually it's not just that we're walking around in an environment which is, which is based around class or patriarchy or white supremacy. We're born into it from day one. We are molded and constructed by all these sorts of ways of being that form who we are. Who I am as a black man sat here on a, on a, on a today, today, Tuesday afternoon is very much molded by 53 years worth of oppression in some way, shape or form. It's not just about race, not just about gender, but also about class. How I am as a working class man, how that's been impacted. How my, how my struggles um, to actually raise the money, to do my training, how has that played itself out in my, in my life, in my career? Mira is quite right in some ways, and we cannot leave some of that material outside of the psychotherapeutic framework. We have to be able to bring that in and talk about it and discuss it and work with this material. So where mixed book actually makes, makes a lot of sense in a way. But one of the things I, I love most of all is about this idea about actually being able to hold the tension of opposites. My phrase or Jungian phrase, if you want to go down that sort of route, the idea that actually self and other have to be able to sit and relate and interact, not because they need to just hear each other, but because, and this is my key point for this brief presentation, from the space in between, there's a Buberian idea, then change comes. It's not gonna come from just the left or the right or from up or down. It's gonna come from whatever is generated from it, that space in between when two people, when two groups, when two political parties hear each other for the first time perhaps ever. That's where change occurs in my view. I wanna keep that very sort of, sort of brief, but that's sort of the wonderful things that, that I think has come out of, out of the book for, for, for myself. But I also wanna end with just a simple quote. And it's this, by Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. The one of the great things about a book like this and many other texts around it as well is they're offering something new to the current discourse and attempting to actually change things by offering something quite radical. I've said my piece, I've timed myself to four minutes exactly. Yeah, there you go. Andrew, back to you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dwight. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go straight to a panel discussion. Um, I was originally going to invite kind of comments between the panel, but the, there's been so many comments coming through the chat. What we're going to do is spotlight all the, the panel members and Mick also. Um, and just just any responses, you know, if you if, if I'm going to kind of John and I are going to bring questions that have come from the chat to you, just feel free to unmute and, and talk. Don't don't kind of stand on ceremony. And I suppose that a broad question that came in a little bit earlier, which is um, how how do we promote um, compassion and um, connection and collaboration in a in a society that that is dominated by individualism? Please feel free just to unmute and jump in. Dwight. I think one of the things is, is about rediscovering our um, respect for each other. And I think it was already mentioned by a couple of my colleagues who, who said it, the idea that actually I don't have to agree with what the other person's position is, but it'd be able to be actually sit back and actually listen to it, then builds a level of, of, of understanding and compassion for that other perspective. It doesn't have to change who I am or, where I, or, or what, I'm, what I'm talking about. It's better to listen to it. It's very different to, to say like Twitter, I think Mick mentioned it earlier on, whereby actually people just cut themselves over their head and they don't want to hear what the other person has to say. They want to destroy that other person in, in a way. It can literally be as, as severe as that. This is about actually rediscovering, actually, rem or oh, change the words, remembering the other person's humanity. I think that's hugely important in, in this sort of discussion. That's where I would go with that. Yeah, thank you, Dwight. Any, any other um, comments? I Jennifer? I well, it's really about a cultural shift. We've been hijacked by a liberal, neoliberal orthodoxy, and it's how can we recapture society and ourselves from that, and culture has a huge role to play. But also, you know, neoliberalism has left us with most of our psychological needs unmet by the society in which we live, and we can see the impact of feeling unheard, invisible. I love what Mick said about how can we have a society where everyone feels they're of worth and in the absence of that we have the political fallout that we have now and that we've seen in the states and and the rise of the right across Europe so it's really really urgent because those unmet psychological needs for identity belonging worth are being 
met by the extremes and we're in a very dangerous moment so I don't know how that feeds in with what everyone else is saying but that's just what occurred to me. Thanks Jennifer. I'm, I'm going to jump to the next question. I feel like Fiona Bruce on question time who's going to apologise by saying we can't get to all your questions but I'm going to read one from Matt that, that's come in and it's easier just to read it than, than uh, paraphrase it. Matt wondered if, if the panel would agree that um, while we talk about the education system, um, if there should be a more humanistic way of educating children in general, moving away from test and exam based to competence, which would stop stress and focus on emotions and feelings. So when they get older, we have a much more grounded and rounded view of the world. I guess it's picking up on your point, Mick, about teaching empathy and um, relationship skills. I, th I think so. And, you know, the exam system ingrains and roots in kids an understanding of the world in terms of competition, in terms of being better than the other, that ultimately it's you against other people in terms of fighting for something. And I think, you know, I, I think if aliens came and saw our education system, they just think we were crazy in terms of the lack of the, the, our inability to prepare kids for the world that is there and what we know is going to make for a thriving world about working together about collaboration you know teaching kids that to help each other going back to the first question really our, our education system absolutely instills individualism into our kids and that's got to be the place to start in building a culture which values community values working together values cooperation values empathy and, and, and compassion for each other mm -hmm. thanks mike any any other comments on that from the panel no okay uh lucia were you about to unmute no okay so we have a question from kate kate smith and again i'll read it out how do we avoid assuming the moral high ground in these conversations because we are quote the compassionate caring ones how do we really value both and when we are philosophically as wrong as everybody else so i think we had dwight and then mick Okay, I'll, I'll go first, just very, just very, very briefly. I think as a therapist, there's always a, there's always the, the fact that I have to remember I don't know the actual answer. Because so I think there's something about this whole discussion. I don't know where it's going to end up several generations down the line. My daughter, and my, my, if she has kids, they will come into a very different world than what I have right now. This idea that I know what the answer should be is hugely flawed, in my view. And you know, as therapists and counsellors, we're very much challenged with actually saying with the, with the not knowing. I think this is part of it. And if we can remember that, then actually we allow something else organic to come through. That's just my personal view. Thank you, Dwight. Mick? Uh, I mean, I think it's a brilliant question. And I think for me, it goes back to what Lucia was saying about self-awareness and reflexivity. And it's bloody hard work. You know, it's really hard work. Uh, you know, in the pluralistic fields, I mean, you might know the pluralistic therapy, which is a therapy trying not to promote, trying to argue that there's lots of different valuable approaches but you know the challenge is then not to get dogmatic about pluralism and go well actually that's the right answer and anybody who's taking one approach is an idiot and an arsehole and doesn't understand and it goes right to the core of the stuff that Lucia was talking about it's really hard work to think you know what what, what am I getting out of being better than the other person here and and you know as I was saying it, it, it needs a constant reflexivity a constant awareness constant challenging it's that work that I think exactly as Lucia was saying is, is such a contribution that as therapists we can make to recognize that it's not just about saying, you know, oh, I don't take the moral high ground. It's about saying, wow, actually, where do, where am I taking the moral high ground? And where do I need to stand back a bit and allow space for otherness? And, you know, as I was saying, for, for that dialogue then to happen across difference, I have to recognize that I don't have all the answers. And it's hard because <laughs> I want all the bloody answers. You know, I've just written a book which has got all these answers and I want to, you know, and I have to say, actually, there's, there's stuff in that book which is wrong and which I don't know and which is messy and which I don't understand and which Miria or Dwight or somebody's going to write better, you know, and that's painful as well. You know, there's pain here that we're talking about. It's, it, but we, we learn, and I think, you know, the compassion is about learning to sit with that and, and to bear that and to bear the messiness. Can I just say, it's also, absolutely, I agree with, with all that has been said. And I think it's really engaging in a dialogue like this. A is also cultivate humbleness, you know, to be humble, knowing that my truth is not the truth. It's still my truth, but it's not 
the truth. And, and also at the same time, if I am able to encounter another one from that place, there are much more chances to be creative and co-construct something that is not there yet. So I don't know, you don't know, but maybe we, we will create it together and is something that is not there yet. And I think the whole point of progression is also that, no? Thank you, Chia. And I think the final final few words before we probably need to start finishing from Myra, which is right, because I rudely interrupted Myra. So it's right that, that you have the last few words, Myra. Oh, thank you, Andre. Well, well the, the, the thing that I'm really sat with is this idea of truth does not equal being right. And I think they're the two things that we have to really separate. So to be able then, and this is the challenge I think that, that, you, that everyone on the panel then is talking about, the challenge that we're being invited to do is to be able to sit and hold somebody else's truth, knowing that it's not a competition about right and wrong. It is about our ability to be and offer humility, humbleness, compassion, and empathy and respect and value to somebody else's truth, knowing that, is, that it is their truth and it can sit equally next to my own and next to everybody else's. And that's a, that's a great place to end, Myra. Thank you for that. Um, my, my last job as chair is to, and I'm literally going to go around the, the, the people on my screen, so not in any order other than um, to thanks to Dwight and to Lucia and to Jennifer and to Myra for joining the panel today and for your amazing comments and contributions and responding to the questions. To Mick for writing the book. As they say, thank you so much for, for for bringing your own thoughts and and ideas into this book. And you, you you've just confessed it hasn't all the answers, which to me sounds like another book that that is going to have to be written at, at some point, Mick. When you know some more of the answers, maybe down the line. Um, and thank you to to everybody who's joined from all over the world. And and you know what what's really heartening is that there is such an audience for for this debate and discussion. And a debate and discussion picking upon Jennifer's point, which is has been um, held with such compassion and care and respect. So uh, a thank you from me. And just as we finish, I'm going to hand back to John um, with a thank you to online events for hosting this um, in association uh, with Cresta at Roehampton.